So uh, at this point, uh, it looks like Andy's been um, taking some questions and holding them back. But if he sends them through, I'll go ahead and, and get going on Q&A. What touch screens can we run with PathPilot, and how would we install it? Uh, good question. Um, many touch screens are uh, what's known as HID USB devices, so they would not need a driver, and that's going to be your best bet. Um, there are kind of two components to a touch screen. One is, um, does it work at all, right? You plug it in, and does it need a special driver? If it needs a special driver, it's a bad candidate because that's hard for us to, you know, find. Is, is there a, a particular driver that even works with the version of Linux that PathPilot runs on top of? But if it's an HID device, it should work. So that's part one. Part two is calibration. Some touch screens, you know, you plug it in, you poke at the screen, and it's right. Some, it's off by half an inch, and you need to calibrate it. And we, um, just this week, actually, were able to find a generic calibration utility that should work. And I say should, obviously, you know, don't have every brand of touchscreen here to test, but should work. It has worked with all the touchscreens we've tried it on. So that's good. We're working on getting that into the software, and it should make it into the public release in April. Um, that said, your best bet is to buy a touchscreen from us. And Hopefully in the next month or two we'll have a touchscreen, uh, low price touchscreen sourced um, that we've gone through and made sure it works with PathPilot uh, and will be supported. So that's what I would recommend buying it from us. Um, but of course we don't sell it yet, so take that with a grain of salt. If you're desperate to buy a touchscreen right now, I don't have a specific recommendation for you. Um, my best recommendation is wait until we have one for sale, and, and then we can support you if you have problems installing it. Um, but if you're desperate, Make sure it's a it's an HID device. Don't you know? Try not to get something that requires a specific driver. So Mark Swanson asks, will PathPilot work with all Tormach mills? Yes, uh, Series 1100s, Series 1100s with the spindle drive upgrade, the three-digit machines, the Series 2, the Series 3, the 770, with or without ATC, PathPilot has uh, configuration selections for all mills. Uh, from Jeff Martin, uh, I mentioned that G84 is supported. The delay, is that supported within the CAN cycle? So um, just to remind folks out there, G84 is a uh, tapping cycle. It's a FANUC standard G code. Um, but on a machine without a spindle encoder or a servo spindle, uh, using a tension compression head, you can tap. And what we're doing there is um, using the tapping head to take up any mismatch between the spindle RPM and the feed rate. Uh, and it works great. It's a fantastic solution. It's the least expensive solution to do tapping on a CNC machine, and it's the most reliable. But you often need to, to tweak the amount of dwell, um, the pause in axis movement as the spindle slows down and then reverses. Um, so to answer your question, Jeff, we wrote into the G84 cycle a canned dwell. So we look at the spindle RPM and the feed rate, and we say, how much do, you, do we think we should put in there? And, and so out of the box, it should work for you if you have an 1100 or a 770. If you have one of the older machines, we didn't recommend tension compression tapping on the Series 1 machines because the VFD did not stop that quickly. But G84 in PathPilot, takes an optional P word, which will override that default dwell that we've programmed in to allow you to tweak the dwell if you're, say, you're using a dull tap or a, you know, you've got a closer tolerance hold or you're using a form tap, something like that. So yes, it'll take a P value to, to override the dwell, but it comes with a default dwell. Jim Halverson, do you advocate a particular CAD cam over others? You bet, Sprout cam, because we can help you uh, use it. Uh, other CAM systems, you know, if you have problems, we're less able to help. Uh, in particular, we've got guys with Bobcat CAM, and Bobcat CAM tends to spit out G-code that in some cases is just nonsense, in other cases doesn't follow kind of the FANUC standard. We're doing our best. Um, what was the most recent example? Had a guy with 
G0 and G28 on the same line, those are two G codes from the same modal group. They both take X, Y, Z values. So G0, G28, you know, X, Y, Z something. I don't know. It, I won't go on and on about Bobcat Camp, but it, I, I do recommend using Spruit Camp because we can help you out with problems. But any CAD CAM system that puts out FANUC legal G code should work under Pathpilot. Um, Dan Bai, machine is number 74, still have original access boards and motors. Yes, you can run Pathpilot on that, Dan. Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and I missed a question from Jim. Can a single path pilot controller be used for both mill and lathe if they aren't used at the same time? Yes, it can. Um, switching between mill and lathe requires a reflash of the firmware in that FPGA board, which the control does automatically if it sees that you're running a different config. Uh, but you'd have to power cycle the computer twice between changing from lathe to mill and mill to lathe. Oh, that's Changing from slant pro to mill and mill to slant pro, that's not the case with the duality. If you change from mill to duality, it's the same same control board, so it just fires right up. Uh, so, Jim, to answer your second question, you could do it. I think it would be enough of a pain that you wouldn't want to bother. Um, Alan, do I need a modified post processor to work on path? I don't, what's your cam? Type in your cam system and I'll let you know. If it worked under Mach 3, it should work fine under path pilot. Uh, Eric Anderson, it does work with the CNC scanner. Uh, I should warn you, there. I know that there are bugs in PathPilot. We've found a few of them. We fix them quickly when you find them. Um, well, none of the bugs right now. You can actually look. We have a a, a bug list up on on the website that tells you what's out there and what was fixed in the last release. Uh, before I go into what bugs are particular to scanner, I want to point out that uh, one. Anything that we found out there right now, if it were critical, we would have pushed a release right away. The things that are listed on that list are, are more just annoyances. Um, CNC Scanner has more bugs than the rest of the software, uh, simply because it was a lower priority. We wanted to get everything else going and working first, but we are committed to getting it working properly. And it's usable right now. Um, you can create a TSI file. You can do a scan. The user interface is a lot easier. I always used to have to go back and read the scanner manual just to get scanner working under Windows, um, this is much easier. So scanner does work, and but you'll probably run into some issues. When you do, please let me know, and we'll get them cleaned up. How about dry run, fixed feed rate, fixed feed, dry run control? Uh, Jeff Martin, there's not a dry run in PathPilot. Um, you can certainly, you know, move up to G to Z3 above the part and re-zero it and run from there. Um, I don't know what you mean by fixed feed rate. If you program 50 inches per minute at, in your G code, it'll go 50 inches per minute. Uh, Joseph, if you're not happy with PathPilot, can the control be switched back? Uh, yes, you can certainly switch back to Mach if you're not happy with PathPilot and if there's a big caveat, and this is one of the reasons that we're saying that we're really only supporting the upgrade kit for computers that were sold in the last few years. Uh, we have a Mach 3 Restore DVD for controllers that we've sold um, in, the, in the past three or four years. Those particular models are listed on the website. Um, if you have a Mach 3 Restore DVD, you can restore your controller and, and get Mach 3 back and Windows back on the system. The PathPilot, uh, install does wipe out the operating system of the computer. So it's going to delete everything that's on that hard drive and install PathPilot on it. To go back, you have to use the Mach 3 Restore DVD. We don't have those Restore DVDs for older computers. That's one of the reasons why we're not, um, why we say we can't support the upgrade for older computers. Uh, it's because if you don't like it, you know, you're, if you've got an old computer without the Restore disk, you're kind of stuck with it. Uh, David Morton, I took my delivery on my 1100 in August last year, so will I need the CD only? David, if you look in the back of your control computer, uh, August would be right around the time we made the switch. If you have the hardware already installed, you will see a second DB25 connector in the back of your control computer with a sticker on it that says reserved 
for future use. Uh, that would that would be reserved for path pilot use. So if you have that uh, second DB25, you don't need the card. You just need the CD. Uh, can I run both Mach 3 as well as path pilot on the same PC? Uh, I mean, yeah, they'll both run on the same PC, but you have to wipe out Mach 3 to install PathPilot. So to go back, you'd have to completely restore the operating system. We don't have a dual boot uh, version. Uh, next question. Um, Dan, there is a slider for the rapid travel, you bet. So I'll bounce over here to the screen share. This is a clamp on max velocity. It goes from 1% to 100. Feed rate, this is for effects G1 moves, will be 0 to 150%, and like, likewise spindle RPM. Uh, and oh, and, and I should mention something. This is actually pretty, this is, uh, this is a fine point that I'll mention it here. See this max velocity slider? This is like a clamp. I use this when I'm proving out a program. If I grab this guy with the mouse and I you know, bring it down to zero, it stops the machine, right? But let's say I'm looking at the part and I'm not looking at the code. I mean, I'm not looking at the screen. So you see, I've, I've clicked the mouse on the slider. And now I'm in it like, oh, I'm looking at the part. My mouse is way above the slider, but I haven't released the mouse button. If I move it to the left, I still have control of that slider. So that's, that's really handy for proving out a part program. I grab that slider and then I'm looking at the part. And oh, something's wrong, I just bring it over to zero. I don't have to make sure that my mouse is in the right spot. So once you've grabbed it, it stays grabbed, which is pretty nice. Um, let me bounce back here. Mark, I've never used Linux. What am I up against? You're up against absolutely nothing here. You won't even notice it's Linux. When you turn the computer on, it goes to the interface. Um, I, some people out there may own a TiVo. If I don't own a TiVo, but uh, a TiVo is a Linux-based um, digital video recorder, you wouldn't know it's Linux. You start up your TiVo and it just says, what do you want to record? Uh, PathPilot is the same way. When you when you turn the operating system on, when you turn the computer on, it goes right to the screen that you saw there when I was doing the share. Um, you press exit, it turns the computer off. It's uh, it's like a, an embedded controller. You won't notice that it's Linux. Uh, does the computer need to be wiped clean and the Linux installed? No, the PathPilot install DVD will wipe everything clean and do the installation. Eric, uh, one of the workshops. The last workshop was taught on PathPilot. That was three weeks ago, and this workshop right now is being taught on PathPilot. Eric, how does the fourth access operation, it's the same as it was under uh, our old software, and the tool pass display does uh, show fourth access ops. Um, I don't have any fourth access code here, otherwise I'd bounce over to the screen share and show you, but it rotates the tool path and, and shows you. Uh, Glenn, I have the really old Dell. When will I be able to buy a new path pilot controller? Um, so Glenn, we've had a lot of people that have really, really wanted this right away. And um, our initial recommendation was like, well, just wait a little while and we'll be able to send, sell you a path pilot controller when we release it in uh, April. Um, however, a lot, of, a lot of people weren't happy with that and really just wanted to buy it now. If you buy a brand new controller from us, um, you know the the one that's on the website, the Mach 3 controller. Uh, if you make a note in the in the sales field saying, "Please send me the DVD too," they will send that DVD along with the new control computer, um, and that'll allow you to put the beta version. You know, you just wipe out the operating system that the new control computer comes on, and that control computer does have the the hardware card already installed in it. So you could buy a new Path Pilot controller now. But you just have to put that install DVD in when you get it. The uh, complete plug and play one without Mach 3 or Windows on it will show up on our website in early April. Dan by. Sometimes it's very obvious the machine's lost its way or has lost some accuracy in returning to cut an area. Homing. Yes, this has entirely been improved with PathPod. The, the reasons that your uh, uh, machine would lose its way, well, let me back up a bit. So this is an open loop system. Uh, in very general terms, the computer sends step and direction signals off to the stepper motors. 
and then the stepper or stepper drivers, the stepper driver energizes the motor and it goes a number of steps, right? Um, when when the motors have gone their number of steps, the control doesn't know exactly how far they went. If you have a machine set up with no mechanical problems, like the coupler on the ball screw isn't slipping, or the gibs are uh, properly adjusted and well lubricated, then if you send the driver the signals in the proper order and with the proper timing, then you never lose steps. I mean, I, some people will say never say never, but I, here's what I'm going to promise you. If you don't have a mechanical issue and you, and you, and your stepper driver is functioning correctly, if you send the steps with the proper timing, you don't lose steps. Where we did have issues with our old control is, uh, imagine a stepper driver, you have to give it some acceleration, and you have to give it some deceleration in that step field. Uh, if Let's say you were running at full speed, and someone just stopped your legs like that. You'd fall on your face, right? If you're running at full speed, and then you slowly decelerate down to walking, you don't fall down. Same idea with a stepper motor and a stepper driver. Our old software with Windows, if it got distracted for a while, and that could have been you unplugging the USB stick, or that could have been, um, you know, uh, processor power management kicking on in the BIOS, or it could have been networking. It could have been you turning the toolpath display on the screen and the computer had to think about redrawing the screen because it wasn't a real-time operating system. Then it would stop sending out steps for a period of time. And then it would eventually catch up and start sending them out again. But when it just stops like that, you, you would lose position. So, Dan, to answer your question, in my mind, if you have a mechanical problem, then obviously changing your control software is not going to help. But 95% of the tech support calls we, we take or have taken are not mechanical problems. They're, they're software related. Um, and yes, the, the FPGA card in this system 100% alleviates that issue. So um, if you don't have a mechanical problem, Dan, yes, PathPilot will completely eliminate the problem that you're having with the machine losing its way. So Wayne Charlton, will PathPilot eliminate the interference caused by TIG welding? Ooh. Um, you know, we don't TIG weld next to our machines here on a general basis while they're machining code. Um, I can tell you that the problems we've had with the Windows controllers and, and Mach 3 with large amounts of electrical interference is simply that the computer will drop USB connection and then re-enumerate USB. And I can tell you that we've got, we've got like a, a, an electrical noise maker here that I assume is much worse than a TIG welder. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a contactor with a highly inductive coil and we wired the normally closed contact back to, to the coil itself to energize it. So imagine you plug power to this thing, and it closes the coil, which opens the circuit, which opens the coil, which closes the circuit, and it just sits there broadcasting EMI like crazy. Like you wouldn't be able to use your cell phone near this thing. Um, and you plug that into the same circuit as the control computer on our old Windows system, and you couldn't jog. I mean, it was crazy the amount of noise. You plug that into the same circuit as a PathPilot controller, and um, it'll run G-code all day long. It's fine. So that would lead me to believe that, yes, you wouldn't have a problem with TIG welding. But here's the caveat. You know, you don't really want to expose your computer to that. Like, if you put an oscilloscope on the 5-volt USB rail, of the computer when you're like starting a drill press next to the computer or turning on this noisemaker, you'll see that stuff as big voltage spikes on that five volt rail. Um, just because the machine control computer appears to do it correctly doesn't mean it's a great thing to do. We don't have long term data on how that affects the circuits in the control computer. Um, my recommendation to you would be yeah, it'll probably work. I would definitely try to isolate if you got other real noisy machines, whether it's a TIG welder or plasma cutter or uh, a lot of solenoid air valves, um, air compressor plugged in on the same line. 
would be to isolate your control computer with a really long extension cord because just the inductance of a you know 50 foot extension cord is enough to really quiet that noise down. Um, but yeah, TIG welders are noisy. I mean, my old shop, you couldn't use the phone when the TIG welder was running. Um, I, I can't promise you. Uh, from Claude, my machine had an extremely serious problem losing its way. It seemed to be fixed by removing and reinstalling cables at the motor dryers. Well, if it was fixed by that, then it wasn't an issue with the control software. Um, I guess, Claude, if, you, if you're still having that problem, definitely call us up. We'll help you troubleshoot it. If it was losing its way on one axis, I could see, you know, maybe a direction signal not being seen properly and just putting the cable back in would fix, fix it. But uh, all three axes, that seems suspicious. Um, from Matthew, is there an option for ETS? Oh, yeah, you bet. We, the ETS um, is fully supported, and if you have a, a passive ETS, you just have to select uh, passive on the settings screen. Uh, Jeff, do we need to save and reload the G-code programs in the computer when upgrading? Yeah, yeah, you're, this installation will completely wipe out everything on your hard disk. So anything you have on that, you want to save off. Uh, save off all your G-code files before doing the upgrade. Uh, Eric, new machines have been shipping with the hardware for PathPilot since August. New machines will ship with no Mach 3 option starting in April. Uh, Andre, will my existing G-code created with a Mach 3 post processor run without a problem or changes on PathPilot? Andre, uh, 99% chance that yes, that is the case. Uh, we've had a couple people, uh, and I mentioned Bob Cam earlier, a couple people with Bob Cam posts that were spitting out pretty bad G code and they, and they had to change it. Um, we've had other instances where even with Sprue Cam spit out G code like the, you know, I showed you this slide several pages back here. Where was it? This guy. I think this was Sprue Cam putting out this code. It was a bad post processor and it's been fixed, but um, you know, you wouldn't. This code wouldn't run on PathPilot, but you wouldn't want it to either. <laughs> it ended up with a bad part. So uh, Andre, what I can say is, uh, if it's legal valid G code, yes, it sure will run without a problem on PathPilot. There are a couple of little caveats to that. Um, Roy Lang, my go-to program for engraving is VCarve Pro. What fonts will be available with PathPilot? Well, if you're using VCarve Pro, it doesn't matter because uh, that's just spitting out G-code. The fonts that are available with PathPilot are uh, the fonts that we have pre-installed. Um, let's show you here. I'm going to go back to the screen share with a conversational. We've got these pre-installed. They're all true type tracer fonts. If you have if you have T -T or true type fonts, excuse me. If you have um, other fonts that are true type fonts, you can put them in this uh, folder and uh, the control will see them and, and you can use them. Um, you know, obviously we haven't tested every single true type font out there. Uh, I know that wing dings did not work. And it was a, there was a true type wing dings that didn't work. But um, so yeah, in, in theory, uh, you can use any true type font. Um, if you're using VCarve Pro, then that's just G code and, and anything will be supported that works in VCarve Pro. Uh, from Kent Myers, when will the Wi-Fi option be available? I think it's on the website now. Uh, Andy will have to answer that. Ah, Kent, will there be support for the Procunior? Um, right now, there is not support for Procunior. Um, we are going to write support for Procunior in. We don't... Um, uh, we were just talking about this a couple weeks ago. We're probably going to ditch the M871 macros and change it to a G84 uh, with uh, some other uh, G code word. So like G84L something would be peculiar. Um, we do want to support legacy code in as many cases as we can, but uh, sometimes it just, you know, M871 seems so far out of the bounds of what was legal FANUC code and required so much setting up on the setting screen, three different 
types of tapping heads with different pitches. So I apologize to you if you've got existing G code using M871 through M874. It probably won't be supported, but I can help you help you go over um, uh, changing the G84. Uh, and is there a way to create new? Yes, there are user-defined M100 files or O-word subroutines um, you could use. Richard Hall, I have 1.4. I see there's 1.5. Should I upgrade? How's it done? Uh, yes, I encourage you to upgrade, um, especially if you're part of the beta. Uh, you know, this is a, a public beta. 1.4 and 1.5 are public beta uh, things. Go over to the software, the Pathpilot Software Center off the Tormach website. That's Tormach.com forward slash pathpilot, and there are release notes. The release notes include upgrade instructions. Uh, Jeff Martin, built-in fonts. Cool. Hey, I think they're cool too. It's uh, it's fun to use. You can. I, I just took a mill over to Science Night at my uh, kids' elementary school, and the kids were typing in their names and choosing a font, and we were just engraving it in a piece of wood. It was a blast. We had a, a line out the door for kids who wanted to do it, so that was pretty neat. Um, Carl, will Pathpilot enable a spindle encoder for fourth axis threading? No, it won't. Uh, I can talk to you a bit about why. I don't know how much time we have or how many other questions. I'll tell you what, Carl, stick around. When we cover the rest of these questions, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a, a little bit about threading uh, and why a spindle encoder might not be the best solution for you. Claude, as an alternative to the slider, can you type into RPM and feed while running? No, you can't. It's G code. Whatever the S word is while you run a G code is going to be the, the command it runs at. Um, when will the path pilot? Oh, Andy answered that one. Can I import my Mach 3 tool table to path pilot? Unfortunately, you can't. Um, that was a request from the beta folks. <sighs> um, it's just it's something we haven't had the time to do yet. We, we, it's one of those sticky things like. Uh, by the time we get around to writing that import utility that parses the Mach 3 tool table and brings it into PathPilot, uh, enough people will have already switched that it'll be less useful of a tool. Uh, right now, it's not out there. I could, you know, any aspiring uh, computer programmers out there that want to write that utility, I could certainly give them the formats. Um, we'll, we'll see about that. But Alan, I'm sorry we don't have that right now. A conversational screen option for gear cutting. Mark, I haven't, but if you haven't checked out, um, uh, Andy's going to have to refresh my memory on the name. It used to be called Gearotic. Uh, Art Fennerty wrote it. It's a fantastic program to generate gear, a G code for gear cutting. Uh, I think he cleaned up the name a little bit to get it into an educational market, uh, and it may no longer be called Gearotic. Um, any other questions? If, if not, I'll go ahead and talk about tapping for a little bit. It's still called gear routing, I guess. I guess uh, kids these days, man. What are you going to say? All right, Andy, forward me a couple more questions, and then I'll talk about tapping and spindle encoders real quick, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, you mentioned a pause button. I've used feed rate slider down to zero to pause. Uh, yes, uh, the feed hold button. I'm sorry. Let's go over here. Um, if you're running a G code program, so just cycle start this thing, and uh, feed hold is pause. There you go. Looks like we're machining from the bottom there. I don't quite know why. Uh, that's what you get for doing uh, demos. But yeah, feed hold, pause, and it works. Oh no, we're coming up. We were, we were too low to start machining. That's what was going on. So or hit space bar, feed hold, it's instantaneous. Um, um, Jim Halverson, can Pathpilot controller be connected to my network to download G code? Uh, yes, but it's kind of the other way around. You connect it to your network, and then your CAD CAM computer sees it as a folder on your, um, as you know, it shows up as a drive on your CAD CAM computer. So you could, I, I, we do this here all the time. You know, in Sprout CAM, it says post process, and then where do you want to save the G code? Oh, I just saved it to the mill. Um, Chris Cox, you're going to add fourth access to conversational screens? Probably not. I mean. No, I, I don't think we will, Chris. It's, it's this real, you know, what do you want to do with the fourth axis? Make a chess piece, a special, I don't know. It just seems like such a general, it's too specific. You know, we try to do general purpose stuff like facing or pocketing. 
drilling and tapping. That's stuff that's really easy to cover. Uh, fourth axis is conversational, and we'd have to know what you were making. Uh, it's a much more of a case for a CAM software package. Jeff, I've read in blogs the Spindle startup delay has been eliminated. Uh, it has not been eliminated. Um, the Spindle startup delay does not pause for G0 moves. It only pauses for G1 moves, um, which is obviously a better way. If you're doing G0, you're not cutting, so why should we wait? Uh, it makes the programs run a lot faster. Uh, it's freaked some people out because they've been like, what the heck? It, you know, it, it was about to hit my workpiece, but it wasn't starting yet. Well, when you get to that you know, clearance plane where it switches from G0 to G1, if the spindle's not at speed, it'll wait. Um, Tom, if we join the beta, will we need to purchase the first? No, you won't have to purchase it. It'll just be posted on the website as an update. Jim, can I write external macro, macros or logic code to check the status of external I.O.? Uh, yeah, we have a, a, that uh, USB-based I.O. board, and it takes M codes in, and you can use uh, M64, M65, uh, M66 in your G codes all you want. Nick, can you jog at a specified inches per minute? Uh, no, you can't, uh, but you can type in MDI commands to jog at a specified inches per minute. So if you're going to machine in, you know, G1, X10, F20, we'll get you there at 20 inches a minute. Is there a way to undo setting an axis zero value? Click by mistake. Uh, no, there is not. I'll give a second for uh, more questions. Oh, here we go, Dave. Andy, will PathPilot show the actual tool in the toolpath screen? Uh, yeah, kind of. It's not going to show you the tool holder. So you see here, I've got um, this tool that's, uh, what is that? That's a eighth inch end mill. I'll go ahead and we'll make it a half inch end mill here, 0.5. And we'll go back here. And you see how it's much bigger now? So it shows the. Uh, a representation of the tool based on its diameter. It's not going to show you the TTS holder or anything fancy like that. All right, so I'm going to go back here and I'm going to cover um, whose question was it? Carl, spindle encoder for fourth axis threading. So Carl asks, will PathPilot enable a spindle encoder? For fourth axis threading, I think you mean will it enable like um, well? For, let me clarify this, Carl. Do you mean will it enable rigid? Can we do a spindle encoder to, to add rigid tapping? I think is what you're asking. Um, fourth axis threading would be a, a a different deal. You could do that in you know either Pathpilot or Mach three, um, but. Um, for rigid tapping, uh, a lot of people want a spindle encoder and say, oh man, wouldn't that be cool if we had a spindle encoder? We can do rigid tapping. So let me clear up some confusion about that. Putting a spindle encoder on uh, a milling machine does not necessarily mean you can do rigid tapping. It means you can do spindle synchronized tapping, right? And what we would be doing there would be um, slaving the Z axis feed rate to the spindle speed. And that's different from rigid tapping. It might let you do tapping without a floating tap holder, but it won't let you do rigid tapping. True rigid tapping requires a servo spindle, and it slaves the spindle to the z-axis. So what's the difference between slaving the spindle to the z-axis or slaving the z-axis to the spindle? The difference is when you tap to the bottom of a blind hole, if you slave the the, the z-axis to the spindle, you can't hit that bottom precisely every time. As your tap dulls, the spindle will slow down more quickly, and you may not reach the bottom. Put a new sharp tap in there. There's less resistance to turning. You might go past the thing. So until you go, you know, adding a servo-driven spindle and increasing the price of the system by five or ten grand, um, putting a spindle encoder doesn't really let you do much. Uh, it just lets you get rid of the tap, the tension compression tapping head. You're still going to have, you know, limitations with tapping a blind hole, just like you would with the tension compression tapping head. Um, and to me, you know, the ER16 and ER20 tapping heads that we sell are probably half, if not a quarter, 
the cost of what a spindle encoder accessory would cost, right? And they're more reliable. You don't have an extra nine wires to bring back to the control, big points of failure. Um, so truly, the tension compression tapping is by far and away it's going to be your most economical, best performance option. Putting a spindle encoder sounds cool, seems really neat, but in reality, it's not going to get you what you know, it doesn't get you true rigid tapping. Um, so I, I think, you know, best option, keep going with the rigid, with the tension compression tapping. So, hey, thank you all very much. If you have any other questions, please send them to pathpilot at uh, Really uh, glad that you guys are enthusiastic about this. And, uh, yeah, uh, send any questions uh, via email if you have them. Thank you so much for participating. Thanks, guys. Oh, and this is for Jeff. Ha, 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 ha.